Hi, my name is Joe Garnier. I'm a chess teacher in the St. Louis area who is doing a little guest lecture here at the Chess Club. And we're going to look at one of my favorite games of all time. And this is a game played between Mark Tamanov and Miguel Nidorf from the tournament Zurich in 1953. And what I love about this game is it's a great demonstration of the initiative in chess and how when you're trying to attack, you need to force your will upon your opponent. You're going to notice, like, they play a fairly traditional orthodox line, and then there comes a point where white simply just runs out of things to do, and then black's initiative becomes overwhelming. So we're going to go through the first part of this game fairly quickly, since the moves are routine, and then go a little slower as we get into the middle game to talk about the specifics. So it starts off with white playing d4, knight f6, c4. This is all typical King's Indian theory, so we don't need to spend too much time on it. Um, castles, like obviously there's other variations and choices, but that's not the focus here. Um, e5. You can't win this pawn because there's some tactics with the um, knight taking e4 a little later. I just tried to draw an arrow, it didn't work, so forget that. Needless to say, it's, white can't try to win this pawn by taking here because there's, there's a tactic where you put the knight on e4 and the bishop opens up on e5. So use your imagination because I don't know how to use this. Anyway. So e5, uh, castles, knight c6, so that's just done to provoke white into closing the position. And this is a big change because back here, okay, we have this potential for the position to open. And now with it closed, everything becomes very static and the pace of the game slows down. Both sides kind of have time to plot things out. So black sees the attack and moves back, white moves back. So, can anyone tell me what the point of this move knight e1 is? Anybody? What's the idea? I gotta get the class involved. Unblock the f pawn. Un unblock the f pawn, right? And what else besides unblocking the f pawn? The, the move knight e1 has a, another, maybe even more important reason than just unblocking the f pawn. Hold control <laughs> c5 and d4. Yeah, exactly. The knight's rerouting to either c2 or d3 is really constructive because as white against the king's Indian, you try to play on the queen side, which, if you can see, my cursor is over here. <laughs> Um, black on the other hand will try to play on the king side, and this repositioning is possible because the center is completely closed. So you put the knight back on e1, it can transfer to d3 later, it can control c5, and begin white's initiative on the um, queen side. So let's go on with it. Black plays knight d7, and this is done for basically the same reason. He wants to unblock his f pawn, he wants to play f5, maybe f4 eventually, and conduct a king side attack. And the next few moves, white just goes about attacking on the queen side, and black goes about attacking on the king side, and they ignore each other. So bishop e3, f5, f3, f4, attacking the bishop, bishop f2, g5. Okay, so it's pretty obvious what black's trying to do here, right? He's just trying to push the pawns forward and go attack the white king, but he hasn't made any real threats yet. So black, although some aggressive posturing. He hasn't really seized the initiative just yet. In the next few moves, you're going to see that change. <clears throat> so, knight d3, kind of as we talked about. Knight f6, same reason. You want to bring the knight back over to the king side where you're going to attack. c5, knight g6, and both sides are just ignoring each other. Rook c1, rook f7. Okay, rook f7 is like sort of this multi purpose move in the king's Indian. Um, one, it obviously could protects the c7 pawn, but it also allows you to do this maneuver where the rook comes to g7 and then this bishop comes to f8 and defends the um, d6 pawn. Anyway, rook c2, it's kind of done for the same reason. It provides some um, lateral defense of the uh, king side, but then also the possibility to double rooks on the c file later. Bishop f8, like we just talked about, pawn takes pawn, <clears throat> and um, how would you take back? You got the pawn, you got the bishop, you got the queen. In my mind, there's only one decent option. Raise your hand if you want the pawn to take back. All right, anybody else for anything else? All right, everybody's right, good. So pawn takes pawn, and because we want to maintain everything in the center. We don't want to have to worry about um, you know, the c5 square um, getting kicked around and all that stuff. So anyway, takes queen d2. G4, rook C1. And up until this point, like both sides have basically been ignoring each other. And so now comes the point in the lecture where, or the game I should say, where black takes the initiative. So 
What do you think Black did in this position? And for those of you who've seen the game before, at least wait 30 seconds. What should Black do right now? At least I hope it's right now and my recollection of this game is correct. We're taking a big risk. It has been 30 seconds, Eric. You've seen this before. No, he has not said this. He hasn't? Really? I thought you were in the little, little, no, little I, camp or something. Uh, okay. I showed him a game so versus like a more of had almost the same goals. Uh, All right. All right. Um, what would you do? G3. G3. All right. So you're, you're going to sacrifice the palm of G3, right? So we've got to calculate this, because that is the correct answer. And it seizes, it seizes the initiative, but it sacrifices a pawn. And this is where Nidorf takes control of the game. The concept of forcing moves is really important here. Forcing moves are checks, captures, and direct attacks. Anything that keeps the initiative and keeps you putting, forcing your will upon your opponent. So moving along. G3 takes, takes, takes. We're in an important moment here. We just sacrificed a pawn, but we have an initiative, but we need to keep it. So what move do we think black should play? All right. What was your name again? Caleb. Caleb. Where would you go? Um, knight to h5. Knight to h5. And definitely on the menu is things to consider. It brings the knight closer to the white king. It does so with the gain of time by attacking the bishop. Um, there's other decent moves here, but this is the really direct one. It's the one that makes the threat, and it's the one that forces white to respond. You know, the good thing about forcing moves is they're easier to calculate. Like if you're sitting here and you're considering rook g7, which is probably a perfectly reasonable move, well, how many decent moves does white have in this position? Two, three, 20? You don't know. But when it's a forcing move, it's easy to calculate. So you play knight h5, you know that um, white's going to have to move this bishop. And it's easy to calculate. So Sorry, I'm like stumbling through this because I'm trying to figure out the computer while I'm talking. So it's not easy. Anyway, bishop h2, bishop e7. Now, somebody tell me what bishop e7 threatens. This is an important one. I need to stop giving hints with the cursor. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, what is the threat? Yes. Exactly. It threatens to play bishop g5 because that's a skewer and that's, that's good for black. So white defends it. Knight b1. So through what tactic does that defend against the bishop g5 skewer? Yeah? Um, if bishop g5 rotates c8. Ex exactly. So just to do the side variation, let's say we go for bishop g5. All right. And um, all right, hold on. Um, not overwrite, new variation. OK, bishop g5. We play rook takes c8, and um, rook takes c8, rook takes c8. And then the queen has a dilemma. Like she has to take the rook back, but then the queen will take the bishop. And in this position, white is just much better having um, two minor pieces for a rook. Uh, black's kingside attack is falling apart, and like, white's just, just better here. So obviously, you know, Nidorf was a you know, grandmaster, so obviously he, he saw that threat. And the move he played to defend it was just so simple. He just played bishop d7 and said, OK, what are you going to do now? And Taman was like, I don't know. <laughs> Queen e1, I don't know. So now it's time to try to get the initiative again. What move should black play? This is one that like all the little kids get right instantly, and then the strong players never get. Because the little kids just like do the first thing that looks good, and the strong players spend way too much time thinking about it and think it's going to be too complicated. If you were still seven years old, what move would you play in this position? <laughs> Eric. That's what you would play if you were five years old, because it's just a check. A little more mature than that. Well, that's, that's a you Bishop problem. H4, Where would you go? Where would you go? Bishop h4. Bishop h4. OK, you guys have like the right idea. Like make a threat. But bishop g5 is absolutely right. Bishop g5, not bishop h4, stupid computer. Bishop g5 because one, <clears throat> obviously with the attack on c1, but look at this bishop. This once terrible, ugly bishop on f8 that didn't do anything is now going to be on e3 where it is simply boss. So white plays knight d2. Now, kids, do you think we should take the knight? No. No, you shouldn't. Never trade. And in this case, really, no, no we'll take it. Like, no. Bishop e3 check. Everyone saw that coming, so I didn't ask. King over. OK, now in this position again, what do you think uh, black should do? I just want ideas.
Not a four. Um, in my opinion, and I'm no grandmaster, but the one thing I don't like about moving a knight to f4 is that it allows uh, your opponent to exchange pieces. And we know that that's just one method of defense, that when you're defending, if you can trade off some of the attackers, you can be in a little less trouble, which would be good. So knight f4 makes sense to me, but I don't know. I think I'd almost want to bring another piece into the attack. I mean, look at this. We have one, two, three, four pieces that could possibly participate. Why not add another? Now we have five. It's like, you know, awesome. And not to mention, there's some tactical issues with the knight on d2 if this rook decides to go hunting. So, bishop to f1. This is really a depressing move to play for white. When you're setting up the pieces before the game's over. It's pretty, it's not fun. So, what are we supposed to do here for black? What do we think? Question. Yeah, simple enough, right? Exactly. Every single piece in the attack. L look at the last 10 moves. White has not done anything other than just respond to what black's doing. Black is forcing his will on his opponent, and white's position is about to collapse. So rook d1, once again, I don't know what to do. I have to move. b5. Black prevents the one thing that white could try to do, which was knight c4, which really wasn't a huge, huge threat anyway. But why bother? Why let him have anything? So white plays a4. And what do you think we play here? Huh. And um, hey, actually, our grandmaster, uh, Yashir Sirwan, is outside. And <laughs> I would gladly invite him in to fill in for me if he'd um, actually open the door and join us. Well, yeah, if he decides to, he decides to. If not, if not. So anyway, um, so what do we play here is black? <laughs> A6. A6, exactly, because it's like, you're going to take me, I'm going to take you back. Same problem. Well, like, you know, it's... So rook c7, and this rook, this lone white rook is going to save the day for white. Nothing on the king's side mattered. This one lone rook is going to take care of everything. You ready? No, it's not. <laughs> just goes back. And look at all the pieces around the, black, the white king. This is just absolutely devastating. Bishop h3. Who can tell me why we can't take it? Well, you can, but why can't you do that? I realize. Oh, that's an appropriately vague answer. <laughs> Specifics, man. OK, specifics. Pawn takes bishop, then what? Queen g1. Queen, queen g1, OK. Then bishop g1. Rook g1, OK. No what's after that? King? Or is that mate? No, king h2, then knight takes up the king. Thank you. Thank you. See, you saved me. I appreciate that. So just to show everybody here. So what was it here? Queen to g1, bishop, rook. King h2 and then knight f3, which is obviously checkmate. So long story short, we are not going to be able to take that um, bishop. So what do we do? Queen e2. Well, knight off comes crashing through anyway. And the rest of this game is just, just basically white just getting demolished. OK, bishop takes back. Bishop takes g2. Queen g2. And now, OK, it looks like white is escaping. It looks like white is able to is traded off some pieces and is um, going to get out of this alive. So what should black do? Yeah? Queen h4. Queen h4. Well, what do you think? Anybody else? Queen h4? Let's, let's see. Ah, queen h4. Because uh, this, this white queen is uh, getting a little low on squares. I mean, let's look at every one of them. Is anything on the g-file going to work? Hey, I'm wearing something here. <laughs> anything on the g-file going to work? No. h-file? No. And anywhere else, there's a fork. So if queen e2? The knight can go to g3. And the same thing if, um, what is it, queen f1, knight g3. So where does the queen go? She goes to g7 to get something. King takes. Rook check, king back, OK, knight e1. Like, white is groveling at this point. Like Black has got the material advantage, the attack. He's got everything. So the rest of it's just history. Knight f7, that's not f7, that's f4. Rook g3, bishop f2. Rook g4, and what should white play here? This is like a last puzzle since this game's about over. This queen h3 looks good. 
You sure I don't have the notation window open here? Okay, good. Training at Queen H3, Knight went back to D2, trying to like hold F1, obviously, because there was that threat, and holding F3, H5, Rook G5, and then after playing Rook G5, Black, no, White just resigned. Said, okay, I've had enough. There's too many threats. Well, golly gee, it's mate in seven. Thank you, Houdini4. <laughs> you ruined chess for all of us. We wanted to find a combination, and you just ruined it. Anyway, my name is Joe Garnier. That's the game I showed today. Mm -hmm.